Thank you for joining us today. We're excited you came across this message. The sermon you are about to watch is from our verse by verse study through the Gospel of Mark. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit hopechurchlv.com and click connect with us to fill out a short digital connection card. Once again, thanks for joining us today. Amen. Good morning, Hope Church. It is really, really good to see you. If I've never gotten the chance to meet you, my name is Trenton. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is my privilege, and I mean that. It is a great privilege to be able to teach God's Word to, to you, the people of Hope Church. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. We'll be there in just a few minutes. But in 2016, I got the opportunity to travel to a little country called Cape Verde. If you've never heard of Cape Verde before, it's a little island nation off the coast of West Africa. And at the time of us going to Cape Verde on a short-term mission trip, Cape Verde was considered by missiologists to be an unengaged area with the gospel. Which meant that for me, on this trip, it was a very real possibility for me to have an opportunity to share the gospel with people who, who maybe have never heard the name of Jesus before in their lifetime. And so I was really, really excited to be able to go on this trip. And upon arrival in the country of Cape Verde, the plan was honestly really, really simple. The plan was to spend all of our time, all of our energy doing what God had called us to do in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 to go up and down villages, to share the gospel with people, to make disciples, to baptize them, and to teach them to obey all that Jesus had commanded them. That was the very, very simple plan for our time there in Cape Verde. And I got the opportunity at one moment during the trip to share the gospel with a group of people sitting outside what you could consider their front porch of their hut, right? And it's probably a group of eight to ten people, and I'm getting the opportunity to, to share the gospel with them, the good news of Jesus. And as I'm sharing the gospel with them, I learned very quickly, you could just feel it as I shared, that for most of the people in that circle, they were not very interested in what I was saying. You ever been there talking to a group of people and you're like, yep, they, they don't care. They're not interested. That was my experience. However, however, there was one gentleman, he was kind of over in the corner, the back right corner of the crew, and as I was talking, you could just tell. You could just tell that the Spirit of God was doing something in this gentleman's heart. His name was Xavier. After I wrapped up my conversation with the group of people, I walked over to Xavier and I got to begin a conversation with him. And as I was talking with him, he was probably 22 years old at the time, and as I was talking to Xavier, I found out a little bit about his story, and I started asking him questions about what I had just shared with the group, and eventually we got to a moment in the conversation where I looked at Xavier and I said to him, Xavier, do you want to repent of your sins and trust and follow Jesus? And with really big tears in his eyes, he said, yes, I do. It was unbelievable. I got to lead Xavier to trust the Lord. Now, the story gets better because in that moment after we prayed and after he confessed his sins and surrendered the control of his life to Jesus, he said to me, do you mind coming to my family and telling with my family all the stuff that you've just shared with me. And I said, no, man, I need to go get lunch. (laughs) No, of course I didn't do that, right? Said, of course, I'd be honored. So I got to share the gospel with Xavier's family, and we got to see some of them place their faith in Jesus. And later on in the trip, we got to baptize them in the ocean with some local believers there. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. God did unbelievable things on that trip. I got to see firsthand what life could look like when you just simply say yes to the life that Jesus has called us to in the scriptures. When when I oriented my life around the gospel and our team did that and we saw the fruit of what God did through just our, our willing participation in the mission of God, the results were unbelievable. To this day, there is a movement of the gospel and churches being planted up and down Cape Verde. It was incredible. I remember being on the beach of that baptism day, and I remember sitting on the beach and, and, and really just thinking to myself, man, this is what life is all about. Seeing God work through broken individuals, seeing the gospel do its thing, man, 
having your whole life oriented around the kingdom of God, man, this is what life is all about. I remember praying a prayer, something like this to the Lord. God, my life, it's yours. In whatever way you want to use me for the sake of your kingdom, my answer is yes, whatever you want for me, Lord. This is what I wanted my whole life to be about. Now, here's what's crazy. A few days later, I got on a plane, traveled a few hours, and by a few, I mean a lot of hours, back to the States, back to regular life, back to my friends, back to my family, back to the natural rhythms of my life. And you know what happened to my life when I got back? Slowly but surely, my life returned to the way I was living before I went on that trip. See, on the trip, my whole life was oriented around the kingdom of God. And when I returned back, slowly but surely, my life returned to being completely oriented around the kingdom of Trenton. And I just remember thinking while I was back home, and I wonder now as I think back on that story, man, why is it so difficult? Why is it so difficult to continually, every day of our life, participate in the mission of God? I saw God use our team in such miraculous ways. I saw what life could look like when we just say yes to living the way God has invited us to in the scriptures. I just, I remember it was so good. How come now when I get back into regular everyday life, I return to my comfortable American Christianity? Why is it so difficult? Have you ever wondered that? You ever felt that way? Maybe it's the mission of God, maybe it's another area of your life, but you just, you, you long to, you really, really do, you long to do the things that God has called you to do, and yet there's something in you, something called your flesh, and it's at war with the Spirit of God in your life, and it's keeping you from doing the things that you actually want to do at the depths of your heart. You ever felt that? I want to put a question on the screen for us this morning that I just want us to wrestle with particularly This morning, why is participating in the mission of God? Why is participating in the mission of God daily, daily, so difficult? How come it's so much easier for us, myself included, to go overseas to tell people about the gospel than it is to cross the street and tell my neighbor? Why is it so difficult? And I want to suggest to you that maybe... Just as I've wrestled with this question myself, I want to suggest to you why I think it's so hard for me personally to participate daily, and maybe what's true for me is also true for a lot of us in the room this morning. Here's why it's so hard for me to participate daily in the mission of God. It's really just one simple word. Here's why. Fear. Fear. And fear, not just general fear, but there's, as I've wrestled with my own heart, there are, there are at least three fears at play that, that are obstacles for me in participating in the mission of God. Here's the first one. It's the fear of being incapable. When it comes to participating in the mission, there's this fear in me that I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not holy enough, I don't know enough theology, I don't know enough apologetics, I don't know how to attach the gospel and see how it affects culture in our day in a very intellectually satisfying kind of way. I just, I feel incapable engaging in our current culture. Which leads to, because I feel incapable, it leads to this other fear that's a big one for me, it's the fear of being uncomfortable. I've recognized in my own life when it comes to participating in the mission, it's just always going to be uncomfortable. And for me, sometimes I value my comfort more than I value my God. And this fear of being uncomfortable, it leads to a final fear that I think all of us can can agree with. It's the fear of being rejected. One of the reasons that I just don't participate in the mission of God is because I don't like the feeling when I share the gospel with somebody and I tell them the truth about God's word and what's, what's true for them. I don't like the feeling or the experience when somebody looks at me and says to me, what you're saying is ridiculous and what you're saying is offensive and I don't want anything to do with it. See, that rejection doesn't just feel like a rejection of a message. It feels like a rejection of me as a person and I hate it. These fears stop me from participating in the mission of God. And I just want to encourage us this morning, friends. Maybe you find yourself with one of these three fears, or maybe all of them, like I do. But friends, if we don't deal with our fears, 
we will always be paralyzed in our participation in the mission. So, does God's word have any encouragement for us? Any encouragement for us as we seek to press on in our participation in the mission? And thankfully, God's word does. In Mark chapter 6, where we're going to study this morning, we pick up the story of Jesus as he's about to send his disciples out on mission. And I believe we're going to find reasons in this story that should embolden us, that should cast out our fears as it pertains to greater participation in the mission of God. We're going to pick it up in Mark chapter 6, verse 7, and just remember some context. This is right after Jesus has been rejected by his own hometown of Nazareth. He's determined to go to other villages and to continue his ministry, but now there's a shift in the story. He's now going to continue his ministry, not through himself, but through his disciples. And so Jesus' experience in Nazareth that we studied last week, it's going to impact the counsel that he's giving his disciples in this moment. Okay, Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 7, we're going to go to verse 13. This is God's word. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. This is like a walking stick. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Verse 12. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is God's word. And as we study this passage and see what's actually going on in this story, in the original context, I believe that we're going to see a main takeaway, a main idea that God wants us to have for our day from this passage. And I'm going to put it in a sermon in a sentence for us to start this morning. Here's the main idea, the thing that I hope all of us walk away with believing and, and trusting in as we leave today. Disciples of Jesus can press on in the mission of God because they have everything they need in the person of God. This is what I hope we see and find as we finish our story today. So what's happening here? What's happening actually in this story? In this passage, we're going to see Jesus tell his disciples a few things. Here's the first thing Jesus tells his disciples. Number one, he called them to go out in his authority and with his people. Look at verse 7. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Notice a couple things from this passage. First, he sent them out in teams. Scholars and theologians think that there are probably a few reasons why Jesus decided to send them out. But one reason may just be because it was easier, safer, and wiser. It was safer and wiser. Going out to preach the gospel and extend the kingdom of God, we know this, it's dangerous work. It's dangerous work. We hear stories all the time throughout history of of the enemy targeting lone rangers in the ministry of kingdom work. We know this to be true, that isolated individuals are easy targets for the enemy. And so Jesus here sends his disciples out together in teams, two by two. And Hope Church, this should encourage us. This should encourage us because Jesus' design for us is to extend his kingdom and accomplish the mission together. Together, not as isolated individuals. One of the primary reasons I think people don't participate in the mission of God so often is because they think that the mission's all up to them and they've got to do it all by themselves. But Jesus' design from the very beginning is to send them out and for us to accomplish it Together, remember, Hope Church, we are all one body. We all play a role. We all have a function. We all have a purpose. And God's design for us as the church is for us to work together in accomplishing the mission together. What if, friends, what if you reimagined your small group, your small group as as the primary people that you extend the kingdom of God and accomplish the mission together with? 
What if one, one small group meeting a month, you, instead of having chips and guac in a Bible study, now, big fan of chips and guac, I'm probably not showing up to your small group if there's not chips and guac, just letting you know. But what if instead of chips and guac one night, you, you took your whole small group and you went and did something out in the city? Maybe among your neighbors, you had a park day or, or you had a cookout or you, you went to watch a ball game together. You did something in the city that was fun and attractive, but you did it with your small group and used it as an opportunity to engage with people who don't normally come to church or wouldn't come to your small group Bible study, but they would come to a cookout. And you use that opportunity together with your small group as an opportunity to meet people and hopefully create a relationship that enables you to share the gospel with them at some point in time. What if instead of meeting for a small group meeting one night, you decided with your whole small group or maybe just with your family as a, as a regular rhythm of your life to go out into your neighborhood and together prayer walk your neighborhood? What might happen as you're prayer walking and somebody stops you or you stop somebody as you see them in your neighborhood and you just say, hey, would you mind, me and my family, me and my small group, we're just, we're just praying over our neighborhood. Is there anything in particular that we could pray for you specifically? And you just watch what God does with that conversation. And I know what you might be thinking. Well, Trenton, listen, my small group's for community. My small group's not for mission. That's what mission trips are for. You go on mission trips overseas, the small groups for community. And listen, I hear you, but I just want to share with you a, a conviction that I have about that in particular. See, here's my conviction, that when you aim your small group, when you aim your small group at community, you're probably going to get community, but you're not going to get mission. But when you aim at mission, you get both. You get both because nothing will deepen your level of community with brothers and sisters in Christ like participating in the mission of God together. What if we reimagined our small group as the primary people that we extended the mission of God with together? This is what God is inviting us into. And these disciples here, they go out in teams, but they don't just go out in their own strength together. They go out with the authority of God. This word authority is a word you should know by now if you've been following with us in the book of Mark. It's the word exousia. Exousia. It speaks to power. It's, it's power that comes as a result of the authority of the person. And see, these disciples were given a specific supernatural authority that Jesus himself had. These disciples were given Jesus' very authority to be exercised over unclean spirits that they were inevitably going to face while participating in the mission of God. I want to remind you, the enemy does not like the advancement of God's kingdom. He is going to come against us, Hope Church. He is going to come against the people of God with full force as the people of God tried to extend the kingdom of God into our city and into our world. The enemy does not like this, and so the disciples need the authority of God because we know in and of ourselves we don't have the authority, but with Jesus' authority, we've got all we need. And see, this authority was given to the disciples so that they could demonstrate that the kingdom of God really was at hand and it really was going to win. So when the disciples casted out a demon, it wasn't so that the, the people who had just been delivered would look at the disciples and go, oh my gosh, look how amazing you are, disciples. No, the whole point of God giving them the authority to cast out the demons was so that when that happened, they would look at the disciples, God, who they'd follow and would marvel at that God, not them. Number two, he called them, Jesus, he called them to pack light and be reasonable. Wait a minute, what are you saying, pastor? Look at it. Verses 9 and 10, this is an interesting little passage. It says he charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. Jesus said to them that when they enter a house, when somebody accepts you into their house, no matter what kind of house you're in, no matter how weird the family might be, 
Wherever you get accepted into, disciples, you need to stay there. You need to be accommodating to the hospitality that they are accommodating you with. You should be reasonable. What Jesus is saying, friends, is this. Disciples, hey, listen, when you get welcomed into a home in one of the villages, you stay there. Even if you see the village, the, the house down the road in the village has a hot tub, listen, you stay in this home. You don't just jump ship. Why? 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 Because if they just continued to jump ship from house to house to house, rather than being consistent, it would kill their credibility. It would kill their credibility to, to, to witness to the people that they were witnessing to and, and uh, extending the kingdom of God to. And so Jesus basically says, hey, listen, just stay put. Be reasonable. Be accommodating to their accommodation of you. But then, then he tells them, don't take anything with you. Except your shoes, except a walking stick, and the shirt on your back. Now, why would Jesus do this? This is so interesting. Well, one pastor and theologian, R.C. Sproul, comments on why he thinks Jesus did this. Listen to what he says. He says, it was as if he was saying, Jesus was saying, listen, disciples, you're going to have to depend on my Father at every point of the mission. You are not to take anything with you, not even the slightest bit of change in your purse. He wanted them to leave everything burdensome behind and rely totally on divine providence. Hope Church, I've heard it said before, and you you got to get this, that if Jesus' goal is dependence, then weakness is an advantage. And we know this to be true. From the scriptures, from Jesus' teaching, if dependence is his goal, if abiding in Jesus, if remaining in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, depending on Jesus, if that's his goal, then weakness actually is an advantage. Why? Because his power is made perfect in our weaknesses. If dependence is the goal, then Hope Church, your neediness in the mission, your neediness for the mission is actually an advantage to you. Why? Because what happens is your neediness and your weaknesses opens up a potential for the possibility for God to pour out his power in such a significant way that he wouldn't have had you had all the strength needed. If dependence is the goal, then weakness is an advantage. Listen, I love this. I love this. Look, listen, money and clothes and food, they're all good things. We need those things. However, when good things become the things that we depend on more than God, they become bad things. Jesus is inviting these disciples, depend on me, trust me, and watch what I'll do. And number three, He called them to be prepared for rejection. He called them to be prepared for rejection. Look at this in verse 11. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Now what is is happening here? Jesus is instructing these disciples on how to respond when people reject the message that they've come to proclaim. You see, in the disciples, they shouldn't be res- surprised by this. Because rejection is what had just happened to Jesus in his own town. And if it happened to him, surely it would happen to them. And this is consistent with Jesus' teaching all across the Gospels. Listen to this in John 15, 18. He's, Jesus says this, that if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Hope Church, let me ask you a question. Why should we ever expect to be treated better than our perfect Savior was treated? His instruction to these disciples, it was really significant. And then he tells them this. He tells them to shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. Now, what's happening here? Is Jesus just trying to tell these disciples, hey, listen, when they reject you, You should really show them what you should do is after they reject you, you just dust off your feet, make their house a little dirtier, and then you move on. Like, is that what he's saying? That's not what he's saying. So what's this actually about? Well, in ancient Jewish culture at this time, when Jewish brothers and sisters traveled into Gentile regions, 
before they came back into Israel, into the Holy Land, the custom was that they were required to shake the dust off their feet before entering back into Israel. It was a symbol in their minds because everything in the Gentile world was what they considered to be contaminated. It was dirty. It was impure. It was unclean. And so it was the custom is before they enter into the Holy Land, into Israel, you should shake off the dust that's on the bottom of your feet to not bring any of that contamination into the Holy Land. You see what I'm saying? That's, that's the custom. Now, here's the question. Does Jesus believe this about the Gentile world? We know from the scriptures that Jesus does not believe this about Gentiles. And we need to be thankful because that's most of us. <laughs> right? But we know this isn't true of what Jesus actually thinks because from the very beginning in the scriptures, from the very beginning, it was God's plan A to redeem the whole world, to see everybody come to a relationship with him. It was told in Genesis chapter 12 that Abraham would be a blessing to all the nations, all the nations, the whole world was God's plan A from the very beginning. So we know Jesus doesn't believe this about the Gentile world. So what is he doing? Here's what he's doing. Jesus is using what is customary for that culture to teach an important truth. So when Jesus tells his disciples to shake the dust off their feet as a testimony against them, it was a symbol to those people that they were rejecting the offer of the gospel of Jesus and therefore are under the judgment of God. I want to remind you, Hope Church, that there is no middle ground when it comes to the kingdom of God. You are either for it or you are against it. And as searing of a symbol this was, it's actually a loving and gracious act. Let me prove it to you. When we in grace, friends, in grace and in humility, and in brokenheartedness, when we're sitting across the coffee table with someone after we've shared the gospel with them and we let them know the truth that apart from repenting of your sins and trusting in Jesus, that judgment's awaiting you, friends, it's actually a loving, gracious act. How much do you have to not love a person to not tell them the truth of what eternity looks like if they reject this? It's a loving act. But afterwards, if they reject it, the disciples are to move on just like Jesus did when he left Nazareth. So, after all of this instruction, <laughs> the disciples are sent out on a trial mission. We don't know how long this mission really was. We just know at the end of Mark chapter 6, they come back and tell Jesus all that they've done. And, and what happens here is they're sent out. And then verse 12 and 13, we see them obey. We see them obey. Look what happens. So they went out. And proclaimed that people should repent. They proclaimed the same message Jesus preached. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So this is what was happening in the first century. But how does this apply to us now? As 21st century Christians living in Las Vegas at this point in history, how does this story affect us today and apply to us today. And what I want to do is I want to share with you three principles, three principles that we can pull from this passage that should greatly encourage us in our participation in the mission of God. And what I want you to see is these three principles, every single one of them combats one of those fears that we had mentioned earlier, okay? So here's the three principles. Here's the first one. It's going to be very obvious, but I think it's so encouraging. Here's the first principle that we can pull from this. Number one, we have been sent out by God. We, as disciples of Jesus, have been sent out by God, not anybody else, not some regular everyday human, not some church. No, 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 no. As disciples of Jesus, we have been sent out, commissioned by the God of the universe, and when you understand who it is that is calling you, when you understand who it has been, who has selected you, when you understand what he's done for you, when you understand all of this, friends, it changes your willingness to go. 
I, the way to illustrate this just very simply is I just remember the first time in my life after my genuine conversion to Jesus, the first time I was ever asked to share my testimony. I was on a short-term mission trip to uh, Honduras, to Gusigalpa, Honduras is where we were working. I actually met a gentleman after Thursday who is from Tegucigalpa, Honduras after the service. That was pretty wild. And so we were in Honduras, and I had just two weeks earlier been saved. I repented of my sins and trusted in Jesus. Now, I got to go on this mission trip. Now, I wasn't supposed to go on this mission trip because a few months prior, I had lied to my student pastor about sending out support letters to go on this trip. And he had told me, hey man, you're not going. And I was like, fair. (laughs) Uh, But then, love it, got saved, and he said, fine, you can come. And (laughs) it's the grace of Jesus in action. And so I'm so thankful that I got to come on this trip because when I was asked to share my testimony, listen, I now actually had a story worth sharing. Because I had grown up as a pastor's kid. I had been in church my whole life. But how many of you know, just because you're a pastor's kid and been around church your whole life, you're not a Christian. And, (laughs) And so I had been asked to share my testimony before a lot. But the problem was, every time I shared it, I just was lying because because it wasn't true. But now I had a story worth telling. And I remember I was on the bus, my youth pastor asked me to share it, and we were going to go to this school, and it was going to be this, like, like literally, it was almost like a preaching moment in front of the whole school in the gymnasium, and I was terrified. I was so scared. I, I was, especially at that time, you might think now, but I was especially at that time not a good public speaker, and I was terrified. But you know what I thought as I I sat in my fear and I thought about the opportunity that was presented to me? Here's what I thought about. In light of the grace that Jesus has shown me, and in light of the fact that the God of the universe has, has picked me for this moment to be the one that shares this story, the God of the universe, it wasn't my youth pastor, Pastor Matt. Jesus was inviting me into his activity in this moment. And when I recognized that the king of the universe was inviting me into his activity, man, I really wanted to participate. When you understand who you've been sent out by, friends, it changes everything for you. I hope you're really encouraged with what I'm about to tell you. Listen, in the wisdom and sovereignty of God, when God was mapping out all of human history, he looked at you, yes, you, with all of your brokenness, with all of your struggle, with all of your past mistakes, with all of your heartache, with all of your gifting, with all of your quirks, yes, you, even the introvert, he looked at every single one of you. And when he looked at you, you know what he thought? You, here, now. God, in his sovereignty and wisdom, has chosen you, yes, you, for this moment of time, at this moment in history, in this place, in Las Vegas, for such a time as this. Apparently, God thinks that you and I are the best people to extend the kingdom of God and the mission of God in this city at this time. Because if he didn't think we were the best, he would have had somebody else here. But because he doesn't, apparently, we're who he has. Friends, do you see how this truth can can cast out the fear of feeling incapable? God's picked you, friend. He's picked you. And you are under the authority of God, and you are empowered by the Spirit of God. You are more than capable. You're more than capable. We've been sent out by God, but here's the second truth. Number two, we can go on because we can trust the provision of God. We can trust the provision of God. Pastoral confession moment here. In the most sincere way possible, I want you to hear my heart. I am not standing up here preaching this as the model for evangelism. If you know me, you know this is something that I've been deeply convicted about in my life, my my lack of participation in the mission of God. And and as I've wrestled with this in particular over the last couple years, the thing that God has just shown me that I'm operating out of more than I would ever care to admit is this fear of being uncomfortable. Friends, I've recognized in my own life that I've got an idol for comfort. I've got an idol of comfort. Meaning that when I'm operating out of this idol, I I am looking for and making decisions for and not making decisions for all for the purpose 
of making sure I'm comfortable. And when I do this, I'm missing out. I'm missing out on participation in the mission. We just need to set our standards clear, and we need to be very honest about this. If you are ever expecting to participate in the mission of God and it not be uncomfortable, you will never participate in the mission of God. Let's just set our standards straight. Participating in the mission is always going to be uncomfortable, and as long as we have this idol of of comfort, we're going to be paralyzed in our participation. And Jesus, in this story, he basically says to his disciples, hey guys, listen, I know it would be easier. I know it would be more comfortable for you if you had more money and you had more clothes and more food. But I want you to know you're going to be just fine. Why? Because my father's watching over you. My father's watching over you. And what the father is going to do is he's going to arrange circumstances. He's going to arrange people, homes, and food for you so that you're going to make it out just fine. The only question is, are you going to trust me? It reminds me of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. Jesus talking to a group of people, listening to him teach the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what he says. Why are you anxious and worrying about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear? Why are you so anxious and worried about that? Look at the flowers. Look at the birds. I I provide for them. I clothe them. I provide for the birds. Aren't you of so much more value than the birds and the flowers? And the logical conclusion is, yes, we are. As human beings made in the image of God, we are infinitely more valuable than those things. And then Jesus says this. So here's what I want you to do. Understanding that you're of more value, that you're my son, you're my daughter, I'm going to provide for you. You can trust me. You don't have to be anxious about these things. Here's your job. Here's what Jesus says. But seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom, and all of these things will be added to you. I've heard it said before that if you don't seek first the kingdom, you probably won't seek it it at all. If you don't seek it first as as the ultimate priority, the the priority that all other priorities fall under, you probably won't seek it at all. Here's my encouragement, friends. When it comes to this comfort factor, this fear of, of being uncomfortable, here's my question for you. Are you orienting your life around what matters most? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Now here's the final thing. The final encouragement, number three. We don't have to be God. You know why we can participate in the mission? It's because we don't have to be God. Look at it in verse 11. Jesus tells them when they reject you, just just move on. Get going. Here's what Jesus is essentially saying to them. He's saying you can move on because ultimately the success of the mission is not up to you. It's up to me. Jesus is inviting us to remember your role, to stay in your lane, to remember that your job is to be the sharer, not the Savior. Hope Church, remember, God has called you to share. He has not called you to save. Jesus did that on the cross. You don't have to wear that burden. Friends, we don't control whether or not people will respond well to our message. But we do control whether or not the people of Las Vegas hear it. But we should press on. Because we don't have to be God. He's just fine in that role. I would rather... Hear, no, let me say this. But what if they reject us, Trent? What if, like you said earlier, they, they're offended? What if they reject us? Well, here's what we do. We remember that ultimately they aren't rejecting us. They're rejecting God. And so we'll be okay. I would rather be somebody, and I mean this. I would rather be someone who risked rejection of the gospel every day than someone who doesn't love people enough to tell them the truth. Are you orienting your life around what ultimately matters? The kingdom of God. We, we can do this. Why? Because we don't have to be God. So what happens? What happens when we press on in the mission as we close? Here's what happens. 
the ministry of Jesus continues. The ministry of Jesus continues in 12 and 13. It says that they went out proclaiming that people should repent. Repent means to to turn your back on your way of living, to agree with God that his way is better than your way, and repent and turn to trust in Jesus. And then they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the ministry of Jesus in action just now through his people. This is what happens. We get to participate in the mission of God. And as we do that, the ministry of Jesus himself continues through our life. As we close, I want to close with a simple illustration. You know, uh, growing up, uh, I was a stellar high school athlete. I was not. I was, uh, I was a great holder on my football team. For the field goals. Um, no, but I, I did actually get to play quarterback in, in, in high school. And again, not just stellar athlete, but, but here's the thing you learned playing quarterback. That when you were down by seven points, you needed a touchdown. And there was under two minutes remaining. You had what, what people would call a two-minute drill. That's what you had to do. You had a two-minute drill. The clock is ticking. Time's running out. You're on your 10-yard line. you got to go 90 yards to get a touchdown. A field goal will not suffice. So the plays that you've got to call now as a coach and as a quarterback, they got to be legit. they got to work. they got to get you to the end zone. And here's the principle that you learn about from that reality. Here's the principle. It's a sports principle. The clock determines the play. The clock determines the play. When two minutes are remaining, you don't have time to just run your plays that get you two yards. You you have to go for the end zone. You've got to get big chunks, 15, 20, 30. You've got to go for the end zone. The clock determines the play. And friends, I just want to encourage you. The clock determines the play in football, but the clock also determines the play when it comes to the mission of God. Here's what I mean. Friends, the scriptures are clear. Our time is short. Our clock is ticking. We might have two minutes, we might have 20 years, we might have 40, we don't know, but our clock is ticking. Here's what we also know, our world is dying. Our world is lost without a savior, without trusting in that savior. We have the savior, he's there, but they don't know him. And it's our responsibility to help them know him. Our world is lost, stats say that 92% of our city don't know Jesus. It's a lot of people. Our time's short, the world is dying. Here's what that means. The time is now. Friends, we've got to go for the end zone. We don't have time to sit around and play with our American comfortable version of of, of Christianity. We've got to go. How do we go? We go do what Jesus says. We just follow his invitation to participate in what he was doing. Sharing the gospel. As we finish, what do we do now? Here's what I want to call you to do. Some of us, myself included, we need to repent. We need to repent for our lack of engagement in the mission. We just need to agree with God that, God, you've invited us into something that we've stiff-armed you on. And, God, we want to we repent and we want to we follow you in this. Number two, I want to encourage you. Maybe today you can start praying daily. You can start praying daily for opportunities to share the gospel. You know, when I find myself praying in the morning, God, give me an opportunity to share the gospel, to love on somebody, to serve somebody. You know what happens? It's crazy. God actually does it. And you know, I don't think it's actually that he's giving me more opportunities. He might be. It may just be that he's opening my eyes to all the opportunities I miss on a daily basis. So we can start praying daily for opportunities. And then maybe number three, and this is, this is not a command. This is an invitation. The Spirit of God's got to lead you. But man, maybe I would encourage you to ask a neighbor for coffee this week and just simply ask the question, how can I pray for you this week? And see what God does. See what God does through that conversation. Maybe you need to set up a coffee meeting. Friends, we can press on in the mission. Why? Sermon in the sentence. Here's why. We can press on in the mission of God because we have everything we need in the person of God. Jesus has given us everything we need. So here's my question. Will you say yes? Will you say yes to whatever role the Lord calls you when it comes to the participation of his mission and the advancing of his kingdom? Maybe you're in here today and 
and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, here's what I would encourage you. Your moment of response right now is for you to just repent and believe the message that these disciples are bringing to you. To repent and believe that the kingdom of God is at hand, that Jesus really is who he says he is. He really did live in your place, die in your place, and and rose again from the grave three days later. He really is who he says he is. And today, you can repent of your sins, surrender the control of your life to him, and follow him all the days of your life. We're going to have pastors down here in just a moment. We would love, we would love to introduce you to Jesus and help you follow him. But for the rest of us, what's the Lord leading you to do? How's he leading you to respond? How is he leading you to to say yes to participation in the mission of God this week? We're going to have pastors down here, like I just said. If you have a prayer request, if you have something you want prayer for, we would be honored. We would be honored to go before the throne of grace on your behalf together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for your word. God, I pray what I've been praying all week. God, I pray that you would do in these moments what only you can do, that you would create movement, that you would create conviction, that you would create encouragement in the hearts of your people to say yes to wherever you're leading them right now as it pertains to the mission. God, we love you. Jesus, thank you for being a missionary God. Thank you for coming to save us. Thank you for taking the initiative to come and love us first. We adore you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we respond to the Lord.